Right now on Morning News Now, former Governor Nikki Haley is off and running in her home state of South Carolina, looking to gain ground, challenging her former boss and current GOP frontrunner Donald Trump. Get on a debate stage and let's go. Bring it, Donald. Show me what you got. But the former president isn't easing up on his lone Republican rival, his threat to anyone who donates to Haley's campaign, and the big endorsement just picked up by President Biden. But the campaign trail isn't the only major issue for Donald Trump. The former president could testify as soon as today in a civil defamation damages case against him involving E. Jean Carroll, what we're expecting in the courtroom after a two-day delay. Boeing on the hot seat. The FAA temporarily caps production of the company's 737 MAX planes after that door plug blew off an Alaskan Airlines flight in midair. A drastic move as the company's CEO faced tough questions from lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And a new show is turning the tables on Broadway with a groundbreaking cast. How it's telling a moving story in a very special way. Our Joe is here and he's going to bring that to us. Exactly. It is a cast where every single star is autistic. You have two and a half weeks left to catch it. We're going to introduce you to them coming up a little Can't later this it. morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Let's get started this morning with the race for the White House as the focus now shifts to South Carolina. After finishing second in the New Hampshire primary, GOP hopeful former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley returned to her home state of South Carolina. She's looking to close the gap against former President Donald Trump. The state's Republican primary will take place on February 24th. A reminder, that's just over four weeks away. Haley addressed the comments that Trump made about her in his New Hampshire victory speech. He pitched a fit. He was, he was insulting. He was doing what he does. But I know that's what he does when he's insecure. I know that's what he does when he is threatened. And he should feel threatened, without a doubt. Another big political headline, President Biden has received a big endorsement. The United Auto Workers Union, which has about 400,000 active members, endorsed the president on Wednesday. The head of the UAW, Sean Fain, says that Mr. Biden had earned the union support through action. The president was the first sitting commander in chief to join a picket line last year when auto workers went on strike. For the latest on the campaign, let's bring in NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray and NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Good morning to both of you. So, Mark, let's begin with you. We know the former president defeated Haley by about 11 points in independent minded New Hampshire. Now we head to South Carolina where Haley was the governor. So what's the state of the race there and what does Haley need to do if she wants to pull off an upset in her home state? Well, we certainly have seen this race now get chippy after the New Hampshire primary. And uh, South Carolina and the future uh, Super Tuesday contests seem to be tough sledding for Nikki Haley. Uh, the electorates in those states are much more Republican-leaning that we ended up seeing in New Hampshire on Tuesday night, where the electorate had a lot more moderate and even some crossover de uh, in, uh, Democrats who participated. Joe, the early polling in South Carolina shows Donald Trump with a sizable lead in the Palmetto State. But we need to see other surveys that have come after New Hampshire uh, primary and now that this has turned into a two-person race. Mark, Trump took to social media yesterday uh, where he threatened to blacklist anyone who donates to Haley's campaign. What exactly does he mean by that? And also, how's Haley responding? Savannah, it was in a post that he ended up making on his Truth Social Network where he said that anyone who ends up giving money to Nikki Haley will be barred from his MAGA movement. And we ended up seeing Nikki Haley respond back with a post on Twitter, uh, or uh, at, but formerly Twitter, now called X, where she ended up saying, hey, uh, go ahead and donate. Bring it, Donald, essentially. Like, let's go. And so she took to the challenge. And it is worth noting that she ended up announcing yesterday that her campaign raised $1 million from small donors after her speech on Tuesday night. I still call it Twitter, too. All right, Monica, let's bring you in here. President Biden got that endorsement yesterday from the UAW. I mean, this is interesting. The actual unions do tend to support Democrats. We've seen in recent years many of the workers shifting to Trump. So how big yeah. of an endorsement is this for the president's reelection bid? Well, it's significant, Joe and Savannah, for the president who likes to call himself the most 
pro-union president in American history. And it was really notable, of course, that he did go and join auto workers on the picket line last fall in Michigan. And so this is something that the Biden campaign was really hoping for, pushing for, and wanting, and something probably that the president really takes pretty personally as well, because labor is a major issue that he cares about. But you're right, there have been some other unions that are still making up their mind because of that exact issue, because there are some of their members, for instance, in the International Association of Firefighters, which had endorsed candidate Biden four years ago, really early on, but they're still waiting to make up their mind. But take a listen to how this was received in the room there yesterday when the endorsement came from the union's president. This choice is clear. Joe Biden bet on the American worker while Donald Trump blamed the American worker. I kept my commitment to be the most pro-union president ever. And I'm proud you have my back. Let me just say I'm honored to have your back and you have mine. That's the deal. And the UAW endorsement is really critical for some potential influence of voters in states like Michigan and Wisconsin throughout the Midwest, of course, what will likely be really critical battleground states. So that's why this is also significant. Monica, before we let you go, I do also want to ask you about an invite that we now know about to the State of the Union. The Texas woman at the center of that high-profile abortion case has received one. Remind us about her case and what message the Biden administration is sending with this invite. Yeah, her name is Kate Cox. She's a mother who last year was pregnant again, and at a certain point she received a fatal diagnosis for her fetus, essentially knowing that the pregnancy couldn't continue in a way that would necessarily even be safe for her own health, but she lived in Texas, so she couldn't get an abortion given the current laws and the current ban there at that time. And she went to the courts to try to see if there was a possible appeal, a possible way that she could do it. She ultimately had to end up leaving the state to get that procedure. And we do know that President Biden and the First Lady reached out to her, had a phone conversation with her on Sunday where they formally invited her to be a guest at the State of the Union in early March. And this is really a part of the administration's push to highlight the stories of real women who have been impacted since the fall of Roe in 2022. Joe and Savannah. All right, Mark and Monica, thank you both. Appreciate it. Well, former President Trump is expected to take a break from the campaign trial this morning to appear at the civil defamation damages trial brought against him by writer E. Jean Carroll. The trial is set to resume today. It was postponed after a juror got sick and former President Trump is expected to testify in his own defense. Mr. Trump has already been found liable for defamation against Carroll, including his claims that Carroll's accusations were a made up hoax. She is now seeking at least $10 million in damages. We have a team here to cover these proceedings. It includes NBC News legal analyst Danny Savellas right here on set with us. We've also got NBC News correspondent Yasmin Basugian outside the federal courthouse in lower Manhattan. And that is where we will start. Yasmin, good morning. So we had this COVID delay at Mint Court hasn't been in session since Monday. So tell us what to expect today. And the big question, is there a possibility that Trump testifying will actually happen today? Yeah, that, that is the big question, right? We're going to know when he's actually on the stand. He, he, he said he would testify in Eugene Carroll's last um, trial. He, in fact, did not. Instead, a deposition was offered. So we'll see if it happens this time around, right? All signs are pointing to, all indications are pointing to the fact that the former president will, in fact, testify. Timing-wise, if he does, that would happen later on in the afternoon. Savannah, as you came to us earlier and you said the former president is taking a break from the campaign trail to be here today. In fact, this is kind of part of the campaign trail for um, the former president on the stop um, in the primary calendar for him. Um, e. Jean Carroll's attorneys, for their part, are starting um, this morning with Roberta Myers, the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine, to speak to the importance of E. Jean Carroll's um, column in, in Elle magazine, along with other testimony as well. And then they would likely move on to the testimony, if in fact he does, to the former president um, of the United States. Yasmin, who else could we hear from today? And then do we have an idea of, of when we could expect to hear a decision on damages? So there are two witnesses that are being offered by the defense here, the former president of the United States, along with Carol Martin, who is a friend of E. Jean Carroll as well, a former 
um, WCBS, I believe, um, news anchor who was told initially about the assault by E. Jean Carroll uh, many years ago. Um, that is also being seen as someone who would possibly testify, although we don't necessarily know if that's going to happen. Either way, we're going to be hearing from the former president because we're going to be hearing that deposition that he offered in the initial E. Jean Carroll case. So nonetheless, we're going to be hearing from him no matter what, whether or not it's a live testimony or if, if it's from um, that deposition. When it comes to the decision, um, there is some speculation. Um, I would say that the judge um, could say, OK, Friday court is in session. Normally, we do not have court on Fridays. It could happen if, in fact, that happens, then maybe we would likely be, see be seeing a decision from the jury um, Friday evening. But again, that is all up in the air. We don't have any facts on that as to whether or not we would actually have court in session by tomorrow. But if they do, then we can be looking at a, a decision possibly by um, end of day tomorrow. Danny, let's bring you in here again on set with us. So Judge Kaplan has set some ground rules if the former president is to take the stand. Remind us what those are and then what happens if he breaks them. Yeah, first, I wouldn't be so sure or so certain that Donald Trump will take mm. the stand. It is possible uh, that he may just be floating that idea to make the plaintiff's team have to spend a lot of time and resources preparing uh, for a cross-examination. Uh, without admitting anything, as I've told you, I have done the same thing before myself. Attorneys do it all the time with their clients, wait until the last minute to decide whether or not to call their client. So uh, in this case, Donald Trump's testimony will be limited. This is a damages only trial. So his testimony can really only cover possibly the issue of punitive damages, which, as his attorneys have argued, could cover whether or not he said what he said out of hatred, ill will, or spite. Those are the words that are kind of the magic words for measuring punitive damages. Maybe he gets up there and says, listen, I wasn't trying to be evil here. What I was doing instead was saying, I don't, I'm saying to the world that what she's saying is false. But then again, you get into that territory that he's not supposed to get into, which is saying that E. Jean Carroll is not a truth teller. So as a defense attorney, would you want Trump to testify? What are the pros? What are the cons? Here? General rule of thumb, when you have someone with as much, especially criminal exposure as Donald Trump, with four different criminal cases and innumerable other litigation or uh, civil cases against him, uh, you generally don't want your client under oath at all ever. But I say that, and yet Donald Trump has been deposed many times in his career, and he has a magical ability of sort of testifying without actually saying anything, keeping everything to opinion, and being very difficult to pin down. So uh, while I know E. Jean Carroll's attorneys will be thrilled to get him on the stand for cross-examination, mm -hmm. this is a case where, yes, any testimony by Trump could expose him to some kind of criminal or civil liability. But at the same time, in this case, with the issues being as narrow as they are and the judge being so committed to keeping Trump on track, uh, I expect that this will really be very limited testimony compared to what he could do, the damage he could do to himself in other cases. Right. <clears throat> Danny Savala is here with us. Yasmin Vesugian outside the courthouse where this will all happen later this morning. Thank you both so much. The state of Alabama can move forward with plans to conduct its first execution with nitrogen gas. Yesterday, the Supreme Court rejected a last-minute appeal by death row inmate Kenneth Smith. His lawyers were arguing the untested method violates the Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Smith was convicted of murdering a preacher's wife back in 1988. Barring any court intervention, he is set to be executed today. Let's turn to some weather news. There's more flash flooding across the south this morning as the east gets ready for unseasonably warm temperatures. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. Yeah, with the wet weather comes some milder air. We're going to see temperatures 10 to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. But the big story remains the southern soaker. We're looking at flooding concerns once again throughout the south central states, the Gulf Coast states, into the lower Mississippi Valley, and also the southeast. We have heavy rain falling once again today. We'll see rain falling tomorrow. So still 33 million people impacted by flood alerts. That's where you see the green. We also have flash flood warnings. These come in, these come out. That means fl uh, flooding is happening now or it's imminent. So you could see those maroon boxes in portions of Texas, also Louisiana, seeing some flash flooding concerns right now. And we will continue to see those concerns as we go throughout the day. This is why radar showing us that we have really heavy rain falling once again. This is coming straight from the Gulf. So a lot of moisture with it. Where you see those darker colors, that's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. It's sort of like 
what just a parade of stories that keeps coming through and that's why we're seeing it over the same spots. Even seeing some lightning, hearing some thunder, we'll see the chance for some stronger storms later on this afternoon. Could see some really gusty winds, even some hail, the chance of a couple tornadoes. But it's early to get this much power to some of the storms and that's because it's coming off with that heat from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Notice how far this rain stretches all the way to portions of the northeast. Also New England, we had some wintry weather and we still will have the possibility of wintry weather in far northern uh, New England. But everywhere else, we're looking at plain rain. As we go throughout the next couple of days, we're going to add anywhere from one to four or five inches of rain. Some spots, so could see up to six inches of rain on top of what they've already had. Uh, as you look at this, we're looking at the darker colors. The reds correspond to the higher amounts, also oranges and yellows. So again, throughout the same spots, the south central states, the Gulf Coast states, into portions of the Tennessee Valley and also the Mississippi Valley, kind of in the same places. Because of all that rain, we're looking at the chance for flash flooding. Where you see this darker blue color, that includes cities like Chattanooga, Atlanta, Montgomery, Jackson, New Orleans, Mobile. You are under the threat for flash flooding once again. We're looking at torrential downpours in some spots, hourly rainfall rates of an inch or higher. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at as well. I mentioned that severe weather threat for Huntsville, uh, Tuscaloosa, Jackson, Mobile, Enterprise, down to Panama City, over to Lafayette. We're looking at the chance for winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, an isolated tornado or two, and also some with any of these storms. Now, we're not expecting widespread severe weather, but still could see some stronger storms as we get throughout the afternoon hours. This is a the setup. There's that area of low pressure. We've had a frontal boundary draped across the area, sort of like a train track, and areas of low pressure, sort of the train cars going over the same area. So we're seeing storm after storm after storm, and that's what we continue to see, torrential rain and also storms along the Gulf. Periods of rain throughout the Northeast. You're going to need your umbrella today. Also tomorrow, it's really not later Friday until we dry out, and then guess what? Later on this weekend, we're going to see See some more rain. So for tomorrow, we're looking at storm system tracking to the east, a wintry mix once again for New England as this colder air works in. Let's end with this mild air because this is good news. It feels good compared to where we have been. Philadelphia today, 55, that's 16 degrees above normal, but lots of 70s on the map. Near 80 degrees in Charleston, 19 degrees above normal, 70s in Birmingham, 60s in Lexington, also Little Rock, and Chicago, 37, much better than where we have been the past couple of weeks. Back to you guys. Spring break is here in the it's Northeast uh -huh. <laughs> in January. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. The FAA is putting a temporary hold on Boeing aircraft's production of its 737 MAX airliner. Boeing will also have to finish an extensive inspection process to let its MAX 737-9s return to service following that scary mid-flight incident this month on an Alaska Airlines flight. All of this comes just hours after Boeing's CEO assured lawmakers on Capitol Hill that their planes are safe to fly. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the latest. The FAA announcing on Wednesday that it is halting all future production expansion of the MAX 9 plane. They also outlined the intense inspection and maintenance process that it will require to get the planes back in the air. Meanwhile, Boeing CEO David Calhoun here on Capitol Hill taking tough questions from U.S. Senators. David Calhoun, Boeing's top executive on Capitol Hill. Did you, you ask for these meetings, sir? Thank Getting a grilling from members of Congress. Thank you. Calhoun making a promise to his customers. Mr. Calhoun, what's your message to passengers concerned about flying on your planes? We fly safe planes. We don't put airplanes in the air that we don't have 100% confidence in. Calhoun's comment comes just one day after the CEO of Alaska Airlines told our Tom Costello that he was angry with Boeing and its leadership team. This after a door plug on a Boeing-built airplane operated by Alaska Airlines exploded out of the aircraft in mid-flight. A problem Ben Minicucci, Alaska CEO, placed directly on Boeing in our exclusive interview. But there's no doubt that Alaska received an airplane off the production line with a faulty door. Lawmakers are demanding answers. Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan, who represents a state uniquely impacted by the airline, grounding 30% of their fleet, said Boeing is taking responsibility for the problem. He does personally and um, assured me that this is the most important issue, which I press on safety, safety, safety. Meanwhile, as Boeing works to solve this problem, senators are warning that they need to catch issues like these well before they happen. Aviation safety can't be reactive. It needs to be proactive. The NTSB plans to head back to Boeing's manufacturing plant on Friday. Their goal will be to recreate the timeline that led to that door plug explosion. And Calhoun is also expected here on Capitol Hill in the near future for a public hearing.
All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Well, when it comes to booking your flight, not airlines are making the grade. We're going to break down the Wall Street Journal's new report on the best and worst airlines. But first, our cameras were there when a 14-year-old girl was pulled from the rubble in Gaza. Now, months later, her family is sharing their story of loss and survival, how they were able to get out of Gaza, coming up on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Russia has accused Ukraine of shooting down a Russian transport plane that was carrying 65 Ukrainian captives to a prisoner exchange. Moscow says all 74 people were killed in the crash that occurred yesterday in the Russian region of Belgorod. Ukraine has neither confirmed nor denied responsibility, but has called for an investigation into the incident. NBC News is unable to verify who was on board or what caused the plane to crash. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with more on this. Megan, good to have you with us. So walk us through what the Russians are alleging about this incident. How was this prisoner swap supposed to unfold according to Moscow? Well, guys, good morning. Good to be with you. As you mentioned, the Russian Defense Ministry is claiming that the military aircraft was carrying uh, 65 Ukrainian POWs and says everyone on board was killed when this plane came crashing down. Now, Russian state media is also reporting that the main intelligence directorate of Ukraine knew about the flight, saying that Ukraine's armed forces were officially warned and that they confirmed receiving the flight information but shot down the aircraft anyway. Ukraine has denied receiving any information about the need to secure the airspace around Belgorod. Guys? Megan, what's been the response from Kyiv about all this? I mean, we know President Zelensky addressed it last night. Tell us also what he had to say. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, President Zelensky speaking last night on what was the 700th day of war. Uh, in his nightly address to the nation, he said it was necessary to establish all the facts as much as possible, considering the crash happened on Russian territory. Uh, and he added that it's beyond Ukraine's control. He's also calling for an international investigation. Now, Ukraine did acknowledge that there was supposed to be a prisoner swap, but says uh, they were not informed about the details of the exchange and how Russia would bring the prisoners to the handover point. Uh, Ukraine also says that there was not in, they were not informed about the need to ensure that that, sa that, that airspace above Belgorod and the surrounding area, uh, they weren't informed about the need to secure the safety. Again, Zelensky is calling for an international investigation investigation into this crash, guys. So, Megan, yeah, Russian state media is reporting both black boxes of the plane have been found. So when it comes to an investigation, what happens next? Is this just something Russia plans to investigate itself, or could someone from the outside come in? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the, the information that we understand, as you mentioned, according to Russian state media, which is citing emergency services, is that um, they did find two of those black boxes. They recovered them, and they're in technically good condition, they say. One box was a flight parameter uh, recording device. The other was a voice recorder. And according to state media, they've been turned over to the investigators. Russia is investigating this. Of course, we've just mentioned Zelensky is calling for uh, international investigators to take over this. Uh, guys, that's, that's unlikely to happen. Mm. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Now let's get to the war in Gaza and the heartbreaking and remarkable story of two sisters who survived an Israeli airstrike on a residential building. NBC's Richard Engel has been following their story for months and he has an update on how they're doing. Moments after an Israeli airstrike on an apartment building in southern Gaza, our camera crew first saw 14-year-old Miral Nijim trapped under a building. It was late October, and the Israeli military was bombing heavily in its reprisal campaign for Hamas's massacre in Israel. First responders and bystanders managed to pry morale free, alive. But with the celebration came heartbreaking news. Morale's mother, Mayada, and siblings, Maria and Ahmed, had been killed. We reported as Morale was treated at a nearby hospital, along with her nine-year-old sister, Mira. Her leg was snapped in two, and Mira's surgery was a failure. Soon, she was dying from infection. Then the Nijims believe a miracle happened. In a chance encounter, a visiting Turkish delegation approved Mira for travel to Turkey for treatment. Very few Gazans are allowed out, and foreign journalists aren't allowed in. So we traveled to Turkey as well. And I was finally able to meet the Nijims at a pastry shop. Turkey also allowed in Mira's father, Mahdi, and Miral. 
They were all dazzled by the choices after nearly starving in Gaza. Could we order some cakes? This one here, this one here, one of that, one of these, please. In a quiet place in the back, they told me how to escape the war. They moved seven times in Gaza, and there's nothing left to go back to. I want to return to school. Of course, all the schools in Gaza are closed. They were all destroyed, she says. They kept moving until on October 26th at 11 a.m., the fourth floor apartment where they were sheltering with 12 other people suddenly turned to smoke and crumbled. It was like I was in an elevator going down, Miral says. The whole house fell on me and I couldn't move. Mira may need more surgeries. Her leg still hasn't healed, and there's a lot she wants to do. I want to go to school to study, to write. I have a lot of things I want to write, she says. After a few bites of cake, she's had enough. <laughs> Mahdi was stressed. His family photos have become his most treasured possessions. When he tries to talk about his late wife and children, he can't. What did these kids do to deserve this, he asks. The Nijibs don't know how long they can stay here in Turkey. The Turkish government plans to take in thousands of Gazans and says it won't turn its back on them. But their hope is to make it to the U.S. Richard Engel, thank you very much. More international headlines now, starting with a visit by U.S. lawmakers to Taiwan. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Labanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Hi, Savannah Joe. Good morning. That's right. The president-elect of Taiwan, Lai ching Ti, has met with the Republican representative Mario uh, Diaz-Balart and the Democratic representative uh, Amy Barra for the first time since his election. Now, Lai ching Ti is a member of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party and will take office May 20th. He hopes this visit is a sign that the United States can continue to support Taiwan and work with other partners to ensure peace and prosperity in the region. In other news, the UK is sending back some of Ghana's crown jewels looted from the court of the Asante King 150 years ago. The 32 treasures are, are part of a long-term loan deal from the Victoria and Albert Museum and the British Museum. They were taken during the 19th century wars between Britain and Asante, uh, and Asante uh, the, during the three year, for a three-year loan, which can possibly be extended in duration. Uh, it includes items like a golden peace pipe, uh, swords and a gold badges. Now, Ghana's chief negotiator hopes the deal opens the door for a new sense of cultural cooperation. And finally, we go to India, where there is a battle over butter chicken, which is heading to a court. The family behind Moti Mahal, a Delhi restaurant brand, claims their grandfather, Monish Gurjar, created the global favorite dish back in the 1930s. The chain is suing rival restaurant Darka Ganji for falsely claiming he created the dish and seeking $240,000 in damages. Darka Ganji claims one of its family members had a partnership with Gurjal when the dish was created and therefore also lay play claims to its creation. Well, we see what happens when the delicious dish is put up on what we expect to be a very spicy trial. Guys. <laughs> a buttery spicy trial. All that right, Claudia. Really good. Thank you so much. I like much. that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up, a potential breakthrough for millions of women who suffer from severe morning sickness. Up next, we'll take a closer look at new research that's offering hope and what expectant parents need to know. Stay with us. Welcome back. There's new hope on the horizon for women suffering from extreme cases of morning sickness. Each year, millions of women are impacted by the debilitating illness, hyperemesis gravidarum. It's a condition that makes pregnant women violently ill for months. Doctors have known about it for decades, but there are still no lasting treatments or a cure. That may be changing soon. NBC News special anchor Maria Shriver has more on what expectant parents need to know. You see pictures of people pregnant and picking cute little outfits and, you know, rocking a baby bump, and that's what I imagined, but I did not have that. In 2018, Asia Grammer had just become pregnant with her first daughter when she became violently ill. I spent my days 
uh, vomiting 20 times a day, pretty much till the end of pregnancy. I was not able to maintain electrolytes and water and food in my body. But did you feel like, wait a minute, People talk about morning sickness. This isn't supposed to be like that, or something must be wrong with me. I'm not strong enough. I can't buck up enough. Yeah, I thought that it was my fault. I guess I'm just being dramatic because there's no other answer for this. Turns out Asia had a condition called hyperemesis gravidorum, a mysterious illness in pregnant women that leads to nearly 400,000 visits to the ER every year. Symptoms include severe nausea, dizziness, motion sickness, and vomiting, which can lead to dangerous dehydration and weight loss for mothers and harm to fetuses. Asia, who's married to singer Andy Grammer, says her illness took a toll on them both. It's a big burden on also the person that's caring for you because you can't leave. You can't leave. Right, because this is the thing. If I'm about to faint every time I stand up, then I can't really be left alone. Perhaps the most publicized case of hyperemesis is comedian Amy Schumer. I feel so bad. Who documented her battle in an HBO special. <coughs> and I just threw up blood. Asia says it was only through Schumer that she learned about the condition. Though her doctor did offer her anti-nausea medication, she says he never once said the word hyperemesis, telling her later he didn't want to scare her. Her doctor wasn't available for comment. Would it have been helpful had he given you that word? It would have changed my entire life because at the time I just thought I was going crazy. But having the label would have showed me that it's actually uh, a common occurrence. Still, there's no single treatment once given that will resolve symptoms for the rest of the pregnancy, nor are there any tests to diagnose it. Geneticist Dr. Marlena Faso is determined to change that. She's become one of the world's leading researchers on hyperemesis. I needed to know what had caused this condition and stop people from having to go through what I did. Two decades ago, she suffered from it and lost her baby. Even today, one out of three pregnancies with hyperemesis don't make it to full term. But Dr. Faso says hope is on the horizon. In a recently published study, she documented a genetic link to the illness. We found that there's a 17-fold increased risk of having it if your sister had it. Her goal to develop a genetic test for hyperemesis, as well as treatments to block the symptoms. Asia says yeah. that would change her life. I might want to have another child. And for a long time, that was a hard no, because I don't want to be sick like that again. Our thanks to Maria Shriver for that report. Really an incredible breakthrough. And joining us now for more on this is Dr. Lucky Seacon. She is a double board certified in reproductive endocrinology and an OBGYN at RMA of New York. That's a fertility clinic here. Good morning. Great to see you again. Thank Great you so much for you. being here. Thank you for having me. So walk us through. We got a little bit of this, but just tell us, like, when somebody presents themselves to you, as a patient, the differences that you see and just kind of the morning sickness that I think at least a lot of women, maybe even most women, I'm not sure, suffer from versus this hyperemis. What's the difference there? Yeah, so most people have heard of morning sickness or nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. It's extremely common. Over two thirds of pregnancies are affected. But hyperemesis gravidarum is an actual medical condition and there's a huge distinction. So allow me to explain. Basically, with hyperemesis, the nausea and vomiting is so severe that it often requires hospitalization, IV hydration. It can cause people to lose about 5% or more of their pre-pregnancy body weight. It can cause electrolyte disturbances. So it's actually a very severe manifestation of the nausea and vomiting. When you have regular morning sickness that's so common, that's usually something that in most people will subside by around 14 weeks. Whereas with hyperemesis, you could have that for, for the full duration of the pregnancy. What should a woman do if she suspects she has hyperemesis? Like, at what point is it worth talking to a doctor about? I think you need to get ahead of it. There's actual data that shows that you can prevent progression to hyperemesis or severe versions of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. If you treat it early and you intervene, it can actually prevent it from getting to that point. So talk to your doctor. And unfortunately, you know, we have to admit 
um, as a field that this is something that's often dismissed or overlooked. Anytime you have a medical condition that's so prevalent, so common, it's very easy to hand wave and say, you know what, it'll pass. You just have to kind of grin and bear it. But if it's to the point where it's interfering with your day-to-day -day ability to function and take care of yourself, if you're losing weight, if you are unable to keep any food or water down, not just on some days, but for many weeks or months, that's a medical condition that requires treatment and intervention. How big of a breakthrough is what we just heard about from our colleague Maria Shriver there? I mean, how big of a deal is this? Put in context for us. It's huge because up until now, we haven't really had a clear target for treatment. People have thought that it was due to the pregnancy hormone, HCG, that's what you detect when you pee on a stick and find out you're pregnant, right? And those levels rise throughout pregnancy, so that is an easy culprit to point the finger at, or higher estrogen levels in pregnancy. But this is a much more targeted um, hormone that this study, and you know, there's other data on this, have really identified to be increased in the blood circulation of pregnant women that have dealt with hyperemesis. And the way they did the study was really interesting because they looked at about 1,300 women who had this severe condition versus 15,000 controls that didn't. And they identified that there was a significant difference in the level of this marker, GDF15. And they actually found that women who had pre-pregnancy lower levels of GDF15 were more predisposed to having hyperemesis gravidarum. So there's something about being sensitized to it, or desensitized rather, um, which is also a way that we could potentially treat this moving forward and prevent it. Really, really important stuff. Dr. Seacon, thank you so much for joining us on this. It's just exciting that there could be a breakthrough, right? Especially when it seems like one of those things where women present themselves to a doctor and it might be one of those situations where it's, it's kind of hard to be believed maybe yes. in some cases because it's like, oh, well, morning sickness comes along with it. I think it's going to be hugely validating for people yes. to actually have something that can be measured potentially to say, yes, you are actually at increased risk of this. And there's something that we can do not only to treat it, but to prevent mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Always great to have you here with us. Thank you. Appreciate have. it. Thank you. Thank you Coming up, if you have an iPhone, you'll want to hear this story. Apple is rolling out a new security feature, how they say it can protect your data even if your phone is stolen. That is up next. We're back now with a new consumer alert. Apple is releasing a new update that could be critical to keeping all of your precious data protected and tackle a growing problem. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has those details. A new security setting from Apple hoping to stop a specific and insidious new iPhone crime. Thieves trick people into exposing their iPhone passcodes, often late at night at bars, then steal their phones. With a passcode, they can change Apple ID passwords and face IDs so they can take lots and lots of money. I have heard from many victims that they said up to $10,000, $30,000. How many numbers? Six. Wall Street really? Journal tech reporter Joanna Stern and uncovered the crime trend. We revealed that this was happening in multiple cities across the U.S., happening around the world as well, but definitely an uptick in these crimes happening in the U.S. right now. And Apple appears to have taken notice. The new stolen device protection setting restricts access with the phone's passcode, instead requiring face or touch ID for multiple settings, including Apple ID accounts and the iPhone's iCloud keychain, which many people use to store banking passwords. For some settings, when the phone is not in a usual location, like home or work, the user will need face or touch ID and then have to wait another hour to use biometrics again before getting access. It is a bit of a hassle but is it worth it for more protection? If you had heard from as many victims as I had who have lost everything, then you would enable this security feature. The security fix works well, but it doesn't do everything. Everyone should still definitely protect that passcode, possibly change it so that it's both numbers and letters. And one more important thing, never store your usernames and passwords in the Notes app on your phone. Back to you. All right, Stephanie Ooh. Gosk, important advice there. Oh, that's a good tip at the end there. All right, now to some financial headlines. Tesla shares are taking a hit thanks to a slow fourth quarter. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. Yeah, as you just mentioned, shares of Tesla are under pressure this morning as fourth quarter results missed forecast. And the company warns sales growth will be, quote, notably slower this year as it focuses on developing its next generation electric vehicle. That model is expected to go into production second half of 2025. 
CEO Elon Musk says ramping up production of that car will be challenging as Tesla shifts to a new manufacturing platform. Etsy has launched a new AI feature called Gift Mode, matching you with tailored gift ideas based on your specific preferences. So it's basically an online quiz that asks you who you're shopping for, the occasion, and the recipient's interest. Those include crafting, fashion, sports, and video games. The tool will then generate a series of gift guides, pulling from options from millions of items listed on Etsy. There's also a gift teaser option where you can send someone a sneak peek of the item in case it won't arrive in time. And Pizza Hut is facing a boycott by consumers around the world after the chain reportedly provided free meals to Israeli soldiers. The outcry began last week after Pizza Hut Israel reposted a story on Instagram, which has since been deleted. Palestinian supporters have also encouraged boycotts against other brands perceived to support Israel, including Starbucks. Pizza hasn't publicly responded or verified the pizzas were provided to soldiers for free, guys. All right, Silvana, thank you very much. Sure thing. The Wall Street Journal has released its annual list of the top-ranked airlines of the past year. And for the third year running, Delta has earned the number one spot. It's actually Delta's sixth win in the past seven years. Joining us now with more on the best airlines of 2023 is Allison Poley, a travel reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Good to have you with us. So Delta's on top. What other airlines ranked highly? And how do you decide who lands where on this mm -hmm. list? So Delta's the winner. Alaska came in second and Allegiant Airlines came in third. Mm -hmm. So the way that we look at this is through objective measures. So we're looking at on-time arrivals, cancellations, and then transportation department data about complaints, lost baggage, all of these operational measures that show how the airlines are performing. What airline made the biggest jump in quality, like really improved over the last year? It was Allegiant. So yeah. a lot of people were surprised to see this airline in third. They're based in Las Vegas, so not everybody gets the chance to fly them. But they really improved their cancellation rates. So last year, they canceled mm. less than 1% of their scheduled flights. Wow. Are they like a low cost thing or not? Or they what are. sort of thing? Yeah. Exactly. They're a budget carrier. So among the likes of Frontier and Spirit, which were toward the bottom of the rankings. All right. So let's talk about the fact that airline travel, as we often talk about, is not always turbulence free. What are some of the areas that customers are most unhappy with? And where is it that airlines could maybe find some spots to improve? So this year, complaints about flights and about the flying experience were so high that the transportation department is actually behind in releasing its data. So there's wow. a lot of areas that passengers are complaining about. But we know that the actual fare costs as well as the flight issues are among the top reasons that people are complaining. So those are measures that we look at when we're looking at the operational metrics for all of the airlines that we're ranking. The good news for travelers is though it might seem like flying is such a pain, more flights are getting to where they're supposed to go. So overall, the cancellation rate among all of the airlines went down. Oh, good well, to hear. That is really good to hear. What are some of the things that people love so much about Delta? I mean, I feel like there's some lessons there, right? If they've been to on the top six out of seven years. Absolutely. So they consistently have the highest on-time arrival rate. So their flights are landing when they are supposed to land. And if you look across their metrics, they have the lowest complaints. They also have the lowest rate of involuntary bumping. So this is when mm. an airline oversells its flight and there aren't enough seats for the people on it. They have to get rid of some people. <laughs> Delta <laughs> does not involuntarily bump a single passenger oh, wow, from its okay. flights. Instead, they're known to ask for volunteers and they offer quite a bit of money to do so. Yeah. <laughs> they're not I like, hear. and this person will be sitting on your lap for the duration <laughs> of the flight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We hope you don't mind. Oh my gosh, I fly a lot of Delta flights, and you do always hear that, and you're like, dang, a thousand bucks? Should I do that? I if it's it keeps not going for up. work, it's like an auction, like, yeah. too. It's like, 1200 <laughs> Do like, I hear 1200 At what point am I caving? <laughs> okay. And you can negotiate those offers as yeah. another tip, just so yeah. you know. Uh, oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you can yeah. be like, I'll do it if you give me more? You yeah. can. More I'm money. So bad at yeah. like that. I would be way too stressed. Yeah. I would be way too awkward right. to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Allison Polly, good to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Coming up, an up close look at a Broadway show that is flipping the script. Yeah, how it's telling an important story with the help of a groundbreaking cast. That's up next.
Welcome back. Get this. John Stewart is returning to host The Daily Show. Stewart will be on air Monday nights through the 2024 election and then will continue as executive producer for every episode until the end of 2025. That is according to a Comedy Central news release. Well, yesterday, The Daily Show posted this picture you see on your screen. It's of Stewart in the studio with his feet up on the desk, captioned, here it is, your moment of zen. Stewart originally hosted the show from 1996 to 2015, winning, get this, 24 Emmys. That's amazing. The show had been without a permanent host since Trevor Noah left in 2022. Are you a fan, Joe? That is very exciting news. And you knew something was up by the fact yeah. that they haven't named a host. So, so true. We'll see what happens now. And him EPing them all is pretty cool. Yeah, I know. That's going to be really there cool. There you go. Looking forward to it. All right. Now to our series Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter a new Broadway musical called How to Dance in Ohio. It is a groundbreaking show about seven young autistic adults starring seven young autistic actors. All of them are making their Broadway debuts in a musical based on a real life story. Welcome! The show begins with a personal message from its seven stars. There is the saying, if you've met one autistic person, you have met one autistic person. You are now meeting seven autistic people. The perfect prologue to a musical. In Ohio. Unlike anything Broadway has ever seen. sat down with three of those stars. Amelia Fay. I've learned that if I raise my eyebrows like this. Connor Tang. <laughs> I look interested. This is your view. Yeah, pretty, pretty good view. Pretty great. And Liam Pierce. It doesn't like spit facts about autism at you. It's not like a lecture. It's really just like bringing the audience into our world. Building momentum, the very The musical, How to Dance in Ohio, is based on an award-winning documentary of the same name. Well, I didn't really understand this whole concept at first. We like to socialize, but it's just, we don't know how. The film follows a group that meets at a counseling center in Columbus, Ohio. These autistic young adults just like use this as a social group to build skills to navigate the world. And eventually decide. And eventually decide that uh, we're going to throw a dance. This is it. One dress to rule them all. While parts of the story have been dramatized, the lyrics capture feelings and anxieties that are very real. Most of the spaces. so many people telling us this is the first time I see myself being represented on stage and they are so happy and so so emotional I don't know why you're thanking me because I want to thank you for telling me for for supporting the show when I was in the audience I could feel that love you can feel that right yeah they certainly felt it on opening night the real life drew when the actors took their bows they were joined the real life Caroline. By the people they play. The fact that you're making your Broadway debut in this show, mm -hmm. playing an autistic character, what does that mean to you? It means so much. There hasn't been a lot of representation of autism in the past. This is changing that. This is a wake up call. If you had seen a show like this when you were younger, what would that have meant to you? I would be like, I feel seen. I feel heard. Tommy, we have so much in common. They hope this musical is just the beginning, inspiring even more stories about autism and more shows starring autistic performers. I just want people to come here with an open mind and an open heart to like take it all in and leave questioning what you have ever thought about autism and want to learn more. Bill Keeping with the theme, the show is sensory friendly. The theater also offers sensory kits along with headphones that provide an audio feed of the show at a lower volume 
If you want to see it, you do have to hurry. The show's Broadway run is coming to an end on February 11th, so you have about two and a half weeks to check it out. I encourage you to do it if you can. Oh, my goodness. How a special story. It really is. They were just so fantastic. It looks like a great show, too. It is. It is. Fantastic voices, great performances. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Thanks, Joe. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, we are tracking more wild weather that is putting millions of Americans in the South at risk for dangerous flooding. It's all part of a massive band of rain that's now slamming the East Coast. What you can expect when you head out the door. The fallout over Boeing's embattled Max jets continues this morning with an unprecedented move by the FAA. The government now temporarily freezing future production of all of Boeing's 737 Max models. Comes after senators on Capitol Hill grilled Boeing's CEO over its safety record. Covering it all in just a moment. Also this morning, Netflix is brewing a legal battle over a new docu-series that's bringing some real-life consequences to Sofia Vergara's portrayal of a controversial Miami drug lord. And later in the hour, sheer heartbreak and frustration in Buffalo after a botched 11th hour field goal attempt left fans reeling over one athlete's performance. But one local cat shelter is now pushing a jilted Bills Mafia to put the claws away. Reminder, it's just a game. Yeah, I love <laughs> that story because I get so much stress and anxiety for the kickers. For the kickers, it's right. It's like too much on one person. It's a tough job. And then that happens and you're like, oh my gosh. I know, so it's okay. a message of, of grace coming up a little bit later. We're gonna begin this hour with the severe storm system wreaking havoc across the country. More than 30 million people have been under a flood advisory or warning because of dangerous, even fatal conditions. Yeah, this here was the scene in Texas last night where a disaster declaration was put in place after a month's worth of rain fell on much of the state. The roads continue to be flooded. Schools are operating on a delayed schedule even as a result of this. And in Louisiana, rescue operations were carried out following severe flash flooding last night and the threat of flash floods has been extended in today. As you can see, we have meteorologist Michelle Grossman with us to break down where these storms are headed next. First though, we're gonna get to NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas who has the latest on the ground in Louisiana. Guad, good morning. Savannah, Joe, good morning. You can see some of the flooding here in Baton Rouge where the ground is just saturated with water. The crews that have been helping vehicles and drivers uh, on these flooded roadways keeping busy overnight with these flood advisories coming out continuously as the region is slammed by the heavy rain. Across the southern plains, this morning communities inundated by relentless rain are gearing up for another round of heavy showers and flooding. That's my mom's mailbox to turn into her driveway. A new band expected to dump inches of rain today from eastern Texas to Tennessee. But another round of storms is set to come through. Rainfall already pouring as much as 10 to 12 inches in parts of Louisiana and Texas, causing terrifying road conditions. This driver near Houston hoisted up from his vehicle after it hydroplaned off the road, swept up in the fast moving water. Nola deployment is separate from the state. Others risking the flooded roadways, while firefighters in Montgomery County spent the day conducting rescues in flooded areas. Take precautions, keep watching the water all night, see if it keeps creeping up, and you know, try to save your car and get your animals out. The torrential downpour creating havoc for authorities too. This officer attempting to block off an intersection going too far and getting submerged in high waters just off an interstate. As the south gets drenched, parts of the northeast are glazed by freezing rain and slick ice, while the west coast prepares for more rain, wind and snow. And that rain has been coming and going. We do expect heavy rain later in the day today. We are 
under a flood warning throughout the day as we also uh, have this fog coming in. Authorities want people to keep in mind that that fog uh, can affect visibility, creating more hazards on the roads. And for people that live in areas that are prone to flood, uh, flooding, authorities want them to use sandbags if possible. Keep in mind for those individuals, those residents, that even just a little bit of flooding can cause serious damages to people's properties. Joe, Savannah. All right, Quad, thank you so much. It's going to check on the forecast for today and the weekend ahead. NBC's Michelle Grossman is here with us with the latest. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi there, guys. And we're going to add more rain because we're looking at adding even two, five, even up to half a foot of rain in some spots. So that's going to be a concern once again today. We're concerned about flooding. We're concerned about flash flooding. We're also concerned about some strong storms. So this is what it looks like for today. That rain and flooding continue for the south central states, the Gulf Coast states, into the lower Mississippi Valley. But the rain extends into the northeast. And we're going to keep that rain in the northeast not only today but also tomorrow. Clearing out a bit on Friday and then we have another round this weekend. Foggy all across the area, so tough travel this morning. Back to the west, we get a little bit of a break once again along the west coast. We have some scattered showers in the Pacific Northwest, but mountain snow moving into the Rockies as we go throughout today, and then another storm system moves on shore. But focusing on the south here, we're looking at 33 million people under flood watches. That's where you see the green. The flood warnings, that's where you're looking at those little maroon boxes. That means flooding is happening right now, or it is imminent. So that's going to move as we go throughout the day, but really concerned about that once again. Again. This is why heavy rain is falling. It continues to fall day after day, and we're going to see it falling today and also tomorrow. We have been seeing some lightning, hearing some thunder here because it's pulling that energy off the Gulf, and it's really warm air kind of interacting with some cooler air. So we are concerned with severe uh, weather as we go throughout the afternoon hours. Rainfall rates locally up to four inches, but again, could see six inches on top of what they've already had. This is through today, also tomorrow, kind of combining that. And it's a wide swath. We're not just talking about the south. It's really into the Tennessee Valley as well, and then portions of uh, the Mid-Atlantic as well. All that flooding is going to lead to the risk of flash flooding, especially where you see this darker blue color. So cities like Asheville, Tuscaloosa, Jackson, down in New Orleans, Mobile, looking at the chance for flash flooding because we will see hourly rates of an inch or more per hour, torrential downpours. This is almost like that summer-like, that spring-like uh, downpours that we'll see as we go throughout the day. Storm hazards, Huntsville, Tuscaloosa, Jackson, New Orleans, Lafayette, Enterprise, Panama City, could see some strong storms. We're looking at winds gusting up 60 miles per hour with any of these storms. Unfortunately, could see an isolated tornado or two. Not expecting widespread tornadoes, but could see a few of them and also damaging hail of an inch or larger. So that will be the story today. And then we have another threat tomorrow. But we do have some warmer weather. Usually when you get this much rain at this time of year, it comes at a price uh, or the warmer weather comes at a price with the rain because we have that southerly flow bringing in that rain, bringing in the flooding, but also bringing in some warmer air. So we're looking at 55 in Philadelphia today. That's 16 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. 60s in Lexington, 60s in Little Rock, 70s in Birmingham, also New Orleans, Tallahassee, 76 degrees, 12 degrees above normal. And Charleston, you are nearly at 80 degrees. That is the place to be, despite the rain, with uh, 19 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Tomorrow, we'll keep that warm air in place. Lots of red on the map showing us that we do have that mild air in place. So 60s in Memphis, also Monroe. Mobile, 11 degrees above average at 73, near 80 degrees in Jacksonville. Raleigh, just far north as Raleigh. We're looking at 22 degrees above average. 72 will be your temperature tomorrow, near 60 degrees in D.C. Boston, 50 degrees. It's going to mount any snow that's there. So that's going to add to some of that wet weather that's out there. Then it's back to reality. Not on Saturday. We're still mild in D.C., 55 on Saturday, but back to the upper 40s on Sunday, and then there's your reality dose on Monday, 45 degrees. Uh, same thing in Cleveland. We're back into the 30s, right above the freezing mark on Monday and 20s by Monday in Boston. So enjoy it as we go throughout the next couple of days. This is our weekend outlook because we're going to be wet once again. So we'll start on the West Coast and kind of make our way east. We have rain and snow, another storm system moving on shore on Friday that's going to bring some flooding rains in portions of the Pacific Northwest, Northern California. Also some higher elevation snow. Could see up to eight inches in some spots. Snow falling in the Rockies, more rain falling in the Southern Plains and also along the Gulf Coast states. So really not getting a break tomorrow. That January warmth does continue with that southerly flow moving in. And we're going to see more wintry weather in 
portions of New England. And then Saturday, a little break for some, but look at all that heavy rain throughout the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley, into portions of the southeast. This is a system that's kind of tacked in place and little low you know, areas of low pressure are riding along it. So just bringing that wet weather. All right. Indoors for a lot of people this yeah. weekend. All right. Ooh, Thanks, all Michelle. All over the place, sure. too. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, despite losing in the New Hampshire primary on Tuesday, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is vowing to fight on as she looks ahead to next month's South Carolina primary. Haley returned to the campaign trail last night, holding a rally in her home state. This all comes as the front runner in the race, former President Trump, is set to return to court today. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us with the latest on all this. Hi, Peter. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Nice to see you. The rivalry here between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley really is heating up. Haley, as you note, returning to South Carolina, the state where she was twice elected governor. She is facing an uphill climb to win there, but she is not bowing out, instead leaning in, taking aim at her former boss after he accused her of being an imposter, even mocked the dress that she was wearing. Haley last night challenging Mr. Trump to a debate, an offer that he has repeatedly refused. Bring it, Donald. Show me what you got. Nikki Haley back home in South Carolina brushing off that double-digit defeat in New Hampshire and former President Trump's personal attacks that followed. And Donald Trump got out there and just threw a temper tantrum. He was insulting. He was doing what he does, but I know that's what he does when he's insecure. Briefly off the trail, Mr. Trump, who holds a commanding lead in South Carolina, is still seething about Haley's refusal to exit the race. On social media, again insulting Haley, calling her bird brain, and overnight warning anyone who contributes to her campaign, quote, will be permanently barred from the MAGA camp after attacking his former U.N. ambassador on stage for staying in the race. I felt I should do this because I find in life you can't let people get away with... Okay, you can't. You just can't do that. Still, the pressure on Haley is growing, with more conservative Republicans now joining the RNC and former Trump rivals, urging her to get out and not to draw out what they say would be a futile and bruising nomination fight. A lot of Republican voters, including uh, party leadership and the president, are a little frustrated because we all know what's about to happen. There is no pathway. But this week's primary also revealed some of Mr. Trump's biggest vulnerabilities, including his weaknesses with independents and moderate Republicans who he would need to expand his appeal beyond his MAGA base. President Biden has already set his sights on November. It's great to be home looking to rev up the support of working class voters in key swing states like Michigan, securing a coveted endorsement from one of the country's most powerful unions, the United Auto Workers, months after becoming the first sitting president to stand with them on strike. I want to pick a line. Donald Trump went to a non-union shop and attacked you. President Biden heads to the critical swing state of Wisconsin today to announce that his administration is going to invest another $5 billion in new infrastructure projects, $1 billion alone in Wisconsin. Mr. Trump today is going to, again, campaign from the courtroom set to appear at his defamation trial where a jury is weighing how much he owes writer E. Jean Carroll. His lawyer just this week, Savannah, said that Mr. Trump is planning to testify in his own defense. All right, Peter, thank you very much. We've got a major development in the Boeing Max 9 investigation. The FAA says that it is temporarily freezing future production of Boeing's Max planes and laying out the exact steps airlines must take to get their Max 9s inspected and off the ground. NBC senior correspondent Tom Costello covers aviation for us, joins us now from Reagan National Airport. Tom, this is really an unprecedented step by the FAA, right? This really underscores the loss of trust and confidence that Boeing now has from the airlines and from the FAA. The FAA taking this unprecedented action on the same day, by the way, that Boeing says it's doing a quality and safety stand down at its plants to try to drill down on the basics. Meanwhile, the FAA says it is now going to clear the MAX 9 to fly if airlines have now followed very, very precise and stringent inspection and retooling processes. Nearly three weeks since the blowout on that Alaska Airlines flight over Portland grounded every MAX 9 nationwide. A 
Alaska says it's already preparing for final FAA inspections and its first MAX 9 flight coming this Friday, resuming its full schedule on February 2nd. United says its flights will return starting Sunday. But the FAA now says it is freezing future production of all Boeing 737s, announcing it will not grant any production expansion of the MAX until we are satisfied that the quality control issues uncovered during this process are resolved. I'm more than frustrated and disappointed. I am angry. This In an exclusive interview, Alaska Airlines CEO Ben Minicucci had a similar demand. My um, demand on Boeing is what are they going to do to improve their quality programs in-house? Under intense pressure, Boeing CEO David Calhoun met with senators on Capitol Hill Wednesday. NBC's Ryan Nobles was there. Mr. Calhoun, what's your message to passengers concerned about flying on your planes? We fly safe planes. We don't put airplanes in the air that we don't have 100% confidence in. But before those existing MAX 9 flights can fly again, they'll have to pass a rigorous inspection process just laid out by the FAA. This is the door plug. That's the door plug right there. In the U.S., only United and Alaska fly the MAX 9. It's taking roughly 10 hours to inspect every door plug. They're checking to see whether the bolts are in place, one, two, three, and four, and whether those bolts are secure. And then they are having to check measurements and gaps and torques. It is a long process. In some cases, that can take 12 hours per door plug. The two airlines taking it on now to get more customers flying as soon as this weekend. So, Tom, we know this is on customers' minds. They're searching now to see what kind of plane they're flying on. What is being done to try and reassure yeah. passengers who might be on MAX 9 flights this weekend or in the future that they are safe to fly? So both United and Alaska, the only airlines to fly to MAX 9, say that they are absolutely drilling down on a very precise inspection process laid out by the FAA, and they will not fly a MAX 9 until they're absolutely convinced that they've done everything possible to double and triple check, and the FAA is also involved in the oversight. Bottom line here, I think if you get on a MAX 9, you can imagine it's been very, very closely looked at following this close call over Portland three weeks ago tomorrow. Joe. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Let's turn to the Middle East now, where Israel is stepping up its assault on the southern Gazan city of Hanunis. Palestinian health officials say at least 50 people have been killed over the past 24 hours. The U.N. says Israeli tanks hit a U.N. facility in the city, which was sheltering thousands of displaced Palestinians. It says 12 people were killed and dozens were injured in the attack. Israel says it's reviewing the incident. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us from Tel Aviv on this. Hey, Matt. So the U.N. called this attack unacceptable. The chief of the U.N.'s agency for Palestinian refugees condemned what he called a blatant disregard for basic rules of war. Walk us through what happened and what we're hearing as a response from Israel as well as the U.S. Well, as you mentioned, you know, uh, as Joe just mentioned, Israel says they're reviewing the situation, but that review by Israel is going to be whether or not, according to Reuters, whether or not it was Hamas that launched the missiles that destroyed that U.N. training center. Now, this was about a, a one building within this training center that was housing something like 30,000 uh, Palestinian displaced people from elsewhere on the Gaza Strip. That one building was housing about 800, and U.N. officials believe that the numbers of dead and wounded are probably going to be going up. Um, but this was a situation that had all the potential for a mass casualty event. And once again, it's going back to the, a sort of he said, she said kind of situation where both sides are trying to pin blame on the other. The Israelis insisting that this was a Hamas attack, that this was probably an errant missile fired by Hamas. And we've seen this kind of dispute before back in the early days of this conflict. So you can expect that this, this dispute is going to continue on for quite a while. Guys. Matt, we are also seeing tensions develop between Israel and Qatar. We know Doha has been playing a major role in negotiating hostage release deals, but there's a leaked recording that appears to show Prime Minister Netanyahu described Qatar's role as mediator as, quote, problematic. So what's been the response from Qatar, and could these tensions harm future ceasefire talks? 
Yeah, I mean, th that problematic comment is something that was actually quite kind compared to what we've heard from Bezalel Smotrich uh, just recently, just today. He piled onto this case and said that uh, Qatar had financed and supported terrorism and that they were playing a double game. But we heard from the Qataris before we had that comment from Smotrich. He said, they said that we are appalled by the alleged remarks attributed to the Israeli prime minister. These remarks, if validated, are irresponsible and destructive to the efforts to save innocent lives. So, and they're undermining the mediation process, and that's the real thing here. If there is no Qatar in this process, that would really tie Israel's hands. They are trying so desperately, and Benjamin Netanyahu himself is under so much pressure to get these hostages out. And the only way so far that's proved effective at doing that is by having some sort of negotiation, some sort of deal with Hamas. Only one hostage has ever been released during this conflict by uh, the actual military incursion by the IDF into the Gaza Strip. Everyone else has been released through a negotiated uh, truce. So if without Qatar, then Israel is going to have a very hard time getting these people back to their families. Guys? Matt, before we let you go, I want to ask you something. Our viewers might remember that we talked about a little while ago. Uh, the International Court of Justice uh, took up this case brought by South Africa accusing Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, we understand that they will deliver their interim ruling tomorrow. Uh, we know a full judgment's not going to come for really years. So what kind of emergency measures could this ruling contain? And how binding is that? What, what would have to be done based on what comes out of this? Yeah, Savannah, to get to your second question first, it is not binding. The ICJ has no teeth. They have no ability to enforce this. And Israel, in particular, has uh, ignored tons of international court rulings. And this would be no different. I spoke with one of the spokesmen for the Israeli government this morning. He said that the allegations that South Africa presented before the court are absolutely absurd. And I asked him, then why are you honoring this uh, with an argument? And he said they are trying to seriously debate this issue. Guys? All right. Matt Bradley, thank you very much. Much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a major leadership shakeup in Arizona's Republican Party. The newly surfaced audio tape and bribery allegations that are now causing one top official to step down. Plus the dangers of artificial intelligence in an election year on the heels of that concerning robocall in New Hampshire impersonating President Biden. We will dig into that after this. We're back with quite the political controversy in Arizona. The state's Republican chairman, Jeff DeWitt, has resigned following the accusation that he attempted to bribe GOP Senate candidate Carrie Lake. A new recording of a conversation between DeWitt and Lake has been released where he appears to offer Lake a lucrative new job. In exchange, she would take a two-year pause from politics. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard joins us now with more on this. Hey, Von, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Look, this is a moment here where you have a key Trump ally, Carrie Lake. She ran for governor, lost in 2022, but has remained close to the former president, appearing at his victory parties, even in Iowa and New Hampshire just this week. And while well, a new audio recording has led to the resignation of the chairman of the Arizona Republican Party. The leader of Arizona's Republican Party resigning after a stunning new audio tape appeared to show him trying to convince a close Trump ally not to run for office. I'll tell you what I can offer you. The Arizona GOP's chairman, Jeff DeWitt, heard in this audio urging Carrie Lake to not run for the U.S. Senate this year after she lost her race for governor there in 2022. There are very powerful people who want to keep you out. In exchange, DeWitt says he could hook her up with a lucrative job. So the, the ask I got today from back east was, this is, yes, this is between us. Is, is there any companies out there or something that could just put her on the payroll and give her, to keep her out? DeWitt says the audio was selectively edited. Is there a number at which... I can be bought. <laughs> That's what it's about. You can take a pause for a couple of years. Because Carrie Lake is not a public official, she is simply being asked to withdraw from politics. It doesn't fall under the language of the bribery statute. Lake, who often wears a mic, decided to run anyway. After the audio was made public on Tuesday, Lake calling on DeWitt to resign. We can't have somebody who's corrupt and compromised running the Republican Party. DeWitt says Lake's team threatened to release a new, more damaging recording if he didn't resign. Reached by phone, DeWitt told NBC News that he was blown away by her recording their private conversations. Lake's campaign denies it blackmailed DeWitt. 
If Lake were to win the Republican primary, she would be expected to face independent Senator Kirsten Sinema and Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego in a three-person race. So, Vaughn, the Arizona GOP is holding a meeting this Saturday in Phoenix known as its mandatory meeting. I have to imagine this might come up during the meeting. I mean, I mean, what happens next for the state's GOP party? Right, especially with Donald Trump actually going to be there himself here this weekend. I mean, Donald Trump usually doesn't run from internal party disputes, but there's questions here about not only who the chairman of the uh, Arizona GOP is going to go be in a very crucial political year, but also Carrie Lake's Senate run. There are a great number of folks who are frustrated that she recorded this conversation with the chairman, and there is some internal dissent. And it's notable that she's not the only one running in this Republican primary, but now County Sheriff Mark Lamb is challenging her, and while Kerry Lake was thought to be the runaway favorite, there is a real opportunity that he could potentially make inroads over the next nine months. But right now, this is uh, uh, casting a lot of doubt over the functioning of the Arizona Republican Party in a really crucial year for the Republican Party. Joe? All right. Von Hilliard, Von, thank you so much. Now let's get to some international news. North Korea says it's expanding its military capabilities after testing new missiles. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga is in Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joseph Anna, good morning. That's right. State media in North Korea confirmed the country has carried out its first flight test of a new type of cruise missile. Now, the announcement comes a day after South Korea said it detected several cruise missiles fired from the north into the sea off its western coast. The Korean Central News Agency said the new missile is still in its development phase and that the launch did not pose a threat to neighbors describing the missile as strategic. The new test is seen as part of an expansion of North Korea's military capabilities in response to deepening tensions with South Korea and its allies, including the United States. Now let's go to Kenya, where scientists performed the first successful embryo transfer in white rhinos in a hope to save the species from inevitable extinction. The, le the last male northern white rhino died in 2018, and the remaining two females, a mother and a daughter, are both infertile. Now, an international team of researchers has performed the first successful embryo transfers in southern white rhinos, paving the way for the technique to be used for their rarer northern counterparts. Scientists plan to implant the first northern white rhino embryo by June this year. If it works, it will save them from extinction. And let's end this sort of the world in Australia, where the American 19-year-old tennis prodigy Coco Goff was knocked out of the Australian Open. She was beaten in the semi-final by Arina Sabalenka from Belarus. Before the game, Sabalenka said she wanted revenge after, back in September, she lost to Goff in the US Open final. Well, she got her revenge by beating Goff 7-6, 7-6, 6-4, and we'll play the final on Saturday. Still, well done to Coco Golf for yet another impressive run. Back yeah. to you guys. I did a match there, too. Yeah, All right. Really. Uh -huh. Audio, thanks so much. Powerhouses, thank you. Yeah. Coming up, Netflix is facing legal trouble this morning over one of its biggest new shows. After the break, more on the lawsuit that's now unfolding against the streaming giant and actress Sofia Vergara. Stay with us. That's up next. Earlier this week, voters in New Hampshire received a robocall that sounded like it was from President Biden, encouraging them not to vote in the primary. Take a listen. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. Well, here's the thing. Of course, that was not actually President Biden. And now law enforcement believe the voice was most likely created by artificial intelligence. Incidents like this are on the rise during this hotly contested presidential election, which could make it harder than ever to know what is true. Joining us now is Sinead Bobel. She is a futurist and founder of the tech education company Way. She also recently published an op-ed outlining the dangers of AI in this political cycle. Good to have you with us on this one. Clearly, it is a problem. Just how big of a problem could this be? How serious could this get this election year and then in the future? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're really just at the beginning, right? So this that, that call that you showed um, with the AI-generated audio of President Biden, that's just one communication channel, phone calls that we're, we were able to catch. So you could imagine on the eve of the general election, deep fake audio, video, imagery going viral across multiple different platforms and communication channels that newsrooms maybe don't have time to verify. And then there's also the added stress of hyper-personalization that generative AI systems allow. So we could each start seeing different types of AI-generated content across different platforms and mediums, which makes it even harder to catch. Uh, so unfortunately, this could just be the beginning of a lot more challenging scenarios involving artificial intelligence. In this op-ed that we mentioned that you wrote, you lay out these real, these two-fold threats concerns. Walk us through those. Right. So on the one hand, we have to grapple with the challenge of AI creating false information, such as the call that you had uh, just shown. But we may also face situations where a candidate or a high profile person is able to cast doubt on the truth, something that did happen by claiming that the evidence was AI generated. So we all remember there were, there were those scandalous tapes of, of President Donald Trump that emerged in, in 2016. Well, in 2024, a candidate in a similar scenario could claim that that was actually just AI. So we start to doubt what is the undeniable truth, which makes a democracy incredibly hard to function because it does depend on shared stories and shared truths. And it makes the job even harder for newsrooms and for fact checkers to verify the truth Shannon, manipulated videos, photos, I mean, that's not necessarily new. So why is what we're seeing now so much more serious? Yeah, that's actually a really great point. Uh, it isn't new, but because artificial intelligence, it can create such pervasive and such targeted content, and it's exceptionally you know, realistic looking at a massive scale, faster and more efficient than any single human operation or human operation more broadly could do. Uh, and across multiple domains too, right? So video is a lot harder for, for humans to kind of create and edit on their own. And then you have audio, then you have imagery. Uh, you can create an entire AI generated website in minutes. So just the scale and how realistic the content can look, uh, very different than just a solo human operation. All right, Sinead Bobo, thanks so much for joining us. We'll continue to have these conversations with you as Definitely. this technology continues to be out there. Thank you. Well, there is a new highly anticipated show on Netflix coming out today. It's a series about Miami drug lord Griselda Blanco. But there's a problem. The real-life family of Blanco is suing Netflix as well as its lead actor, Sofia Vergara, in a lawsuit over compensation and unauthorized use of her, quote, name, image, and or identity. NBC News correspondent has, Sam Brock has more on this story for us from Miami. Hey, Sam, good morning. Yeah, Savannah, good morning. Look, Griselda certainly looks like it's going to be a smash hit for Netflix. But yes, they are embroiled right now in the middle of this legal battle with the sole surviving son of Griselda, Michael Blanco, and her estate. What they want, Savannah, artistic recognition, compensation, and potentially a temporary injunction. But thanks to a last-minute legal maneuver from Netflix right here, the show is available at this moment, and the fight goes on. The highly anticipated Griselda on Netflix. I swear. I know what I'm doing. Features Colombian actress Sofia Vergara playing the woman known as the cocaine queen of Miami and the Black Widow. But the buzzy docuseries spotlighting South Florida's wild drug trafficking in the 70s and 80s and covered by NBC News. They were a huge name in Colombia. Has hit a real life legal hurdle with her son, Michael Blanco, and her estate claiming years of notes, stories, and personal narratives were taken with no compensation. Netflix, as we've alleged, is using these ideas that were part of uh, interviews, that were uh, memorialized in writings and notes, Nobody else could have those ideas and nobody else could have those stories. The emergency motion filed by Blanco and his team names Netflix, Sofia Vergara, and the company she co-founded, Latin World Entertainment. Netflix has declined to comment to NBC and Vergara. I'm proud of the whole show. I think I couldn't have done anything without, you know, this cast. Seen here at the premiere with Access Hollywood told Telemundo this week that she was not very aware of the lawsuit because she's been on tour. Él sí que me da admiración. But explained she's always been a fan of Michael's and plans on reading his book. 
Behind court doors, Netflix's attorneys pushing back on Blanco's claim that his stories and ideas were misappropriated, arguing he agreed to share his work with two intermediaries before Netflix obtained it. Novel, original, and unique, but it's not being expressed as an idea, they told the judge. He's attaching it to the literary work. It's a duck. This is about copyright infringement. Como camera. Como la jefa. Blanco's attorneys telling us they never pursued a cause of action on copyright grounds. We're going to make the big money for... Because this son just wants to shape the story of his own mother. He wants to be able to make sure that whatever details are displayed about his mom to the public, that they actually have some sort of real basis. And it's not just something you pulled off of Wikipedia and the Internet. At this point, the judge has to decide, is this case going to be tried, guys, in state court or federal court? Is it about misappropriation or copyright? Until that is decided, there's no movement here. As for Sofia Vergara, she did tell Telemundo this is a deeply personal project for her. She lost her brother in the 90s who worked in that business and has been waiting more than a decade to represent Griselda. Back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Coming up, more beef for your buck. Yeah, after the break, we are hitting the drive through and we are looking at how some fast food chains are supersizing portions for Americans hungry for a good deal. And I would recognize those In-N-Out animal style fries anywhere. Now I'm hungry. We've got more on that story for you next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. After years of complaints that food prices are rising, it looks like fast food chains have some good news. That's right. Restaurants are now introducing some new supersized products for not much more money. But is it really as good as it all sounds? And how good, I wonder, is it for all of us? Here to answer that question is NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa. She's on set with the details and pictures of way too much good food at this hour for us. Good morning, Emily. Guys, good morning. I feel like I missed my opportunity to bring a McMuffin to the set. <laughs> In the midst of growing popularity of weight loss drugs like Ozempic, some fast food giants are bucking the trend and offering customers more beef for their buck. But experts say what's good for your wallet may not be so good for your health. This morning, new meaning to the phrase supersized. McDonald's bringing back its double Big Mac burger after a four year absence. That is huge. Four meat patties versus two on the regular Big Mac, plus extra sauce. For a round at stores we found, only about $1.50 more. And while some are steering clear. So double Big Mac sounds like a heart attack waiting to happen. Others say bigger is better. So we're talking four patties. How does that sound? It sounds great. Oh, yeah, that's that's going to be fabulous. Surveys show nearly half of consumers are fed up with so-called shrinkflation, smaller food packages for the same price. Experts say it's one reason why customers are craving more value and fast food companies are responding. There's nothing better than a Subway Series footlong, except when you add a new footlong sidekick. Subway introducing a new trio of bigger footlong snacks and Costco releasing a giant seven inch cookie. This is the double Big Mac. McDonald's says its bigger burger came from consumer demand for more beef. We've listened to our customers and we understand their desire for larger, high quality burgers that fill you up and are delivered in a convenient and affordable way. McDonald's is planning to open 10,000 new stores by the end of 2027 and also expand into Starbucks turf with its new chain of Cosmics serving coffee, specialty drinks and snacks. The demand for high calorie, low price food growing despite the rise in popularity of weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Nutritionists warn the added value in these products may come at a cost to your health. Compared to a regular Big Mac, McDonald's says the double contains about 30% more calories in sodium and 40% more fat. The more you consume these foods, the worse off your health is likely to be. Okay, so food executives are certainly watching the impact of weight loss drugs, but they're not panicking. Remember, the food industry is one that is used to adapting to trends. So experts say we'll continue to see new products and marketing efforts. And if you do want to splurge on a double Big Mac, nutritionists say consider replacing the sides with healthier <laughs> alternatives, maybe a salad and water to help balance things out. There's you also have to learn how to unhinge your jaw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> well, the, like, <laughs> the boxes themselves are like super 
size yeah. too to fit the burger. <laughs> yeah. I, right. yeah, I think nutritionists probably have a lot to say about just ordering it in the first place. Right? It's very interesting. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank I appreciate you. it. Okay, for more money news this morning, we've got the latest read on unemployment CNBC. and GDP. Yeah, CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with those numbers and other financial headlines. Silvana, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, we are just getting a fresh look at the health of the U.S. economy. Jobless claims, they are up 25,000 to 214,000 versus an expected 200,000 from economies. Now, from economists, now fourth quarter GDP, the U.S. economy grew 3.3% in the fourth quarter. That's much more than the 2% expected. And for all of 2023, the economy grew 2.5%. That's up from 1.9% in 2022 as strong consumer spending and hiring up ended recession fears all right more people than ever are spending too much of their income on housing and it's due to the sharp rise in rent over the past few years a new report from harvard finds that the number of americans spending more than 30 percent of their income on rent and utilities hit a record high of 22.4 million in 2022 now housing is considered affordable if it costs no more than 30 percent of a person's gross income the report says while rent increases have slowed since 2022 as more apartments and houses have been built wages just haven't kept pace and home prices in the hamptons are soaring new data from real estate firms miller samuel and douglas Elliman shows properties in the long island beach towns changed hands at an average price of 1.85 million dollars in the fourth quarter that's up 45 percent from the previous year and more than double from free from free pandemic levels the number of listings have also climbed but there are more buyers than sellers the report says one in four deals are ending in bidding wars wow there's Ooh, just right. bidding wars for houses everywhere yeah no good good Does for those folks <laughs> yeah right, good for them thank you <laughs> thank you yes. and now to a look at how one group is turning the page so to speak on the traditional book club these events they're called reading rhythms they're described as a series of reading parties and there is a difference there between a book club this is where people show up read together and socialize i went along to experience this new chapter for myself books have always given readers a source of comfort an escape a chance to learn something new but a reading party that's a novel idea the accountability of reading in community with other people at the same time and actually like ending the night and having read 50 or so pages i'm like wow like go meet Last year, friends John LaFrary, Ben Bradbury, Tom Wooster, and Charlotte Jackson were inspired to start a collective in their Brooklyn neighborhood. When did reading enter this friendship equation? I created this playlist called Reading Rhythms, which is a bunch of electronic music to read to. And I love reading to music, have done for many years, and I shared that with Tom. Ben and I started early on to talk about New York is a crazy place, and we want to be social, yet at the same time, it always feels like being social is at odds with the book we want to read or kind of, <laughs> kind of interact with to actually work on ourselves. We had like 10 people over. We put a big tarp up on our rooftop, we put up some studio lights, and put together a really cozy environment. And when we went through the event, it just felt like there was a spark of magic in the air. Taking the name from Ben's playlist, Reading Rhythms was born. So this is, as you all say, right, a reading party, not a book club. Hey, not a book club. Exactly. <laughs> What's the difference yep. between those two things? People bring their own books. You bring what you're already reading. And we have a lot of people come in that are avid readers. And we have a lot of people come in that really want to get back into reading. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a great reading recommendation zone. It's been so cool just, like, just to witness how many different varieties of books have been in conversation mm. with each other. One of our first events, Tom brought a corporate finance textbook to the event. <laughs> what? Um, what? Their organized meetups, which now host hundreds of people, consist of half-hour reading blocks, followed by discussions with other attendees, often complete strangers. And while $20 will get you a ticket in, the connections made are priceless. One of the coolest things I've seen so far is people leaving the event saying, I think I'm gonna meet my best friends here, or spouse, Aww. which is pretty incredible. Have any couples come out of a reading party? Mm. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend, JC, turned up at Reading Rhythms chapter six or seven, and now we're dating and boyfriend and girlfriend. With sold out events for the next couple of months, the community is welcoming more and more members, myself included. I met a few regulars, is this your first time at Reading Rhythms? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I come, we 
weekly. This is my third time. And found some other newbies like me. Did you all know each other before? No, no we just no. met. You just met right now? Yeah. yeah. What made you think I'm gonna go try it out? I love reading, first of all, but I feel like it's a great way to like socialize and then also not drink, so I love that. We immersed ourselves in the first reading session. And using the books as icebreakers, the conversations went way deeper than what's just on the page. We had all been in this phase where we read a lot of self-development, non-fiction type books, and it gets kind of exhausting after a while. One of the things that has increased my quality of life the most is reading fiction. I remember last time I was here, I was talking to someone throughout the whole night, and by the end, I was like, wait, we haven't even talked about like what to do for work. These parties are creating a shared experience, much like books themselves. Reading is this quiet, independent activity for the most part, right? Why push the boundaries on that? Why make it something where you're connecting with others? What's cool about reading is it tends to indicate that you're taking interest in something, which I think is a vital sign of your own relationship with yourself. And so in coming to Reading Rhythms, it's people that are coming and wanting to learn and just be curious and open-minded in a room with 100 other people that want to do the same thing. All right, so as you heard in that piece, there's a wait list. They're all sold out. So now they're trying to actively grow their team of co-hosts, people to lead these events and those conversations in New York City and beyond. They want to move beyond just the city. What are the requirements? A love of reading, of course, and a person who embodies their core values. Those are connection, intentionality, playfulness, and wonder. That sounds like Joe. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of the face-to-face. -face. I like that they're not talking about their job. Right. So I think that Something alone is worth Let's co -host considering. One. There we go. We love to read. Except we're going to get really comfortable chairs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The cushion was... Really comfortable yeah. chairs. Yep. That's a great, great idea. Great improvement. All right, coming up, a botched Bills field goal attempt not only dashed the team's Super Bowl dreams last weekend, it also caused some fans to sound off on their kicker. But one nonprofit and its furry friends, they're not having it. We'll explain after this. <laughs> Welcome back. White Lotus star Tom Hollander was surprised to receive a pay slip for a seven-figure sum. The only problem was the check wasn't for him. It was for Spider-Man star Tom <laughs> Holland. Hollander said the two actors used to have the same agent. One day, Hollander got an email saying, Payment advice slip, your first box office bonus <laughs> for the Avengers. No. Yeah, he told Seth Meyers the pay slip attached was for an astonishing <laughs> amount of money. The actor, who is not in the Avengers, said he had been mistaken for Holland before, just never in person, and probably never for that much money. So when <laughs> parents who have misheard his name introduce him to their children, the kids are, quote, very, very excited, then confused. <laughs> then disappointed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's, I'm excited, though. He's going to be in this new Swans yes. thing with Truman Capote. I'm yeah. excited yes. to see that. Yes, yes, so right. true. All right, well, Buffalo Bills fans still recovering from their heart-wrenching loss to the Kansas City Chiefs in the NFL playoffs last weekend. Many are putting the blame on kicker Tyler Bass, who missed the game-tying field goal in the fourth quarter, but an unlikely fan base is coming to his defense, calling for an end to online bullying. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us with that. Hey, Stephanie, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. I'm not sure if you're football fans, but as you may know, a whole game can come down to a field goal kick, and a field goal kicker can either be the hero or, well, Tyler Bass. <laughs> He's probably not had a very good week. In fact, I'm sure he hasn't. But a bunch of supporters have rallied to his side, including some furry friends. It was a critical moment in the playoff game between the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs late in the fourth quarter. The Bills missed a 44-yard field goal that would have tied the score, the kick hooking to the right. Kansas City then running out the clock to seal the win. Bills fans devastated, and some channeling their anger towards 26-year-old kicker Tyler Bass, one posting, get ready to cash some unemployment checks. But the sports world showing support for the young player. Do not blame the kicker, because I know that's the easy thing to do right you now. Know? Quarterback Josh Allen comforting Bass after the game, and the Kelsey brothers weighing in. I feel for the kickers that when this happened. And on Bass's home turf, fans going even further to rally behind the kicker. We stand with Tyler Bass 
don't bully our friend. The 10 Lives Club, a cat rescue nonprofit in western New York, is asking for donations in Bass's name. Returning the love he showed for rescue cats in this campaign, Show Your Soft Side. People are just making comments and sharing nice words about Tyler Bass in their donations, and we're just blown away right now. Fans of a certain cat loving singer who was at the game are joining in as well. There are a lot of Swifty groups out there that are rallying and donating on behalf of Tyler Bass. The Bills did not reply to NBC's request for comment. Searches for Bass's social media accounts Tuesday on Instagram and X prompted messages that said the accounts don't exist or may have been removed. For many, Bass's miss brought back the devastating moment in Super Bowl 25 when victory was almost in their grasp. 33 years later, Buffalo still hasn't won a championship. But this morning, these members of Bill's Mafia say some things matter more than the final score. I just hope that's bringing him some joy right now during this time. The 10 Lives Club says it's received more than $260,000 in donations, <laughs> many of them coming in increments of 22. His number, his jersey number is 2 so people have been writing checks for, Aww. well, writing checks is old, but, you know, yeah. sending $22 in. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, well, good for him. Good I still write the occasion. Good for him. Good for yeah. the cat. Yes. Yeah. I hope he feels better. No it's a terrible Same. loss for the Bills Absolutely. and all the Bill fans made it out so there. so far, you know. I know. I know. And to have it come down to that. Yeah. Uh, all right. I love that story. Former, wow. Yeah. Stephanie, that thank you good. so much. Thank Great to have you here. You're welcome. Finally this hour, former MLB star pitcher Billy Wagner played 16 years in the big leagues, leagues getting the call to win the game out of the bullpen. Now he's waiting for another call. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. Don't get so tight. Be big, okay? Billy Wagner coaches mm -hmm. baseball. Don't reach, don't reach. For the Miller School Mavericks in Charlottesville, oh, Virginia. Okay. It's probably the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Others might disagree. Wagner was an all-star relief pitcher in the major leagues for 16 years. His 100-mile-per-hour fastball made opposing batters wince. I don't think uh, any of us would have imagined that at 5'5", 135 pounds, I'd have been rolling out of Southwest Virginia to be a major league pitcher. So um, yeah, every moment was special. This day, Wagner is waiting for a phone call to learn if he has been elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. He finds out he was just five votes shy. You know, it's disappointing, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just how it goes. Not easy. Fans often feel the voters for the Hall, the Baseball Writers Association, can be fickle. Wagner's numbers are some of the best in the history of the game. So he'll have to, you know, wait till next year. You know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, I'm excited that uh, I'm on the ballot, uh, had an opportunity, and, you know, now I'm going to go back and I'm going to do what I do best. Don't rush. And that is Coach. I've never seen somebody smile at so much. Harry Smith, NBC News. Mm -hmm. I'll do it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.